Brian Cutler has been qualified as an expert in social and uh, false confession psychology. Let's go to court. Uh, in cases involving that topic. I've also, in my uh, scholarly work of um, editing uh, journal and editing books, I have uh, worked with uh, a small number of prosecuting attorneys to, to publish uh, their, uh, uh, their work in, in our sources. You are listed as a year 2020 speaker for the International Association of Interviewers. Uh, is some information I found, is that correct? That's correct. Can you tell the jury what the International Association of Interviewers is? Uh, yes, it, it's an association uh, that is, is uh, dedicated to, to training interviews and, and uh, best practices in interviewing uh, and to set up a uh, a forum where they can uh, network with uh, one another and, and uh, learn from one another. Have you also testified in police officer disciplinary proceedings? On one occasion, yes. And what was that about? Uh, that was a case where um, a Vancouver uh, police officer was, was charged with various disciplinary uh, in, infractions uh, following an investigation by a special unit of the, uh, uh, the RCMP. In, in, in that case, uh, the, the Vancouver police officer was subjected to uh, rather coercive interrogation uh, procedures, uh, and I testified as, as an expert on, on interrogation uh, in that case. Doctor, do you recall uh, when it was the defense team for Kelsey Thomas first reached out to you in this case? I would have, I, I believe it would have been uh, June 2019. And initially, my office contracted with your company to perform a case review of the final interrogation of Kelsey Thomas. Is that your understanding? That's correct. And generally speaking, what would a case review entail? What services would you perform? Uh, in, in a case like this, we would, uh, uh, where there is a videotaped uh, interrogation, uh, we would uh, review, carefully review uh, the, the recorded interrogation and other uh, relevant material. All right, so while we're going through a little bit of the qualifications still, um, just so we understand, Professor, what happened there is that an expert's allowed to give their opinion and they have to qualify as an expert. Right. There was a question about why wouldn't the prosecutor just uh, stipulate, we were, we were talking about that. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, the prosecutor just stipulate to his expertise because clearly he's qualified to be an expert. Um, and my thought on that is that he wants to get all these really high level credentials out there in order to build his credibility, including when we were on break, that he's testified 75 times, 55 times in front of a jury, um, has 11 false confession cases, the latest being August of 2019. Uh, the defense did a really good job building the credibility of this witness before he offered his opinion. Well, absolutely. His credentials are far above and beyond what they need. And, you know, he's written books and he teaches and he's a member of so many associations and he's formed his own uh, incorporation so he can testify uh, or, or put all these things under the umbrella that he does. So he's extremely qualified. We were talking because it was just, you know, you get to a point where a jury might believe anything that he says mm -hmm. because of these qualifications. Right. Pretty amazing. And, and Latonia, we never know how a guy's going to testify, a person, a witness is going to testify, but he certainly right now, he comes off as a, a person who's very seasoned. Um, as a prosecutor, you're going to have to cross-examine this person. I've been in the position so many times, and you kind of feel them out when they're on the witness stand. And, you know, you got to be careful, because I always say, Latonia, you don't want to get into the cage with the bear and lock the door, because that bear, being the expert witness, could really tear you to pieces. So it's an art form on how to cross, and sometimes that is just get out. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely correct. And the thing that I would say when you're doing a, a cross-examination of an expert witness, unless you've gotten so well versed on that expert witness, because sometimes expert witnesses will have their own weaknesses, where in other cases they didn't testify very well, you can be able to use that, uh, or there are other experts out there who say their theory is not correct. And you can sometimes go and cross-examine them on that and be able to kind of poke some holes in their testimony. But it's better just to get out of there, because if this is not your 
wheelhouse of expertise, you don't want to go and tangle with somebody who this is theirs because it ends up making you not look that great and makes them look even better. So you get in, you get out, you get make your point and go on to your next witness. Yeah, one of the examples of that was the medical examiner of the defense called where they had a lot of information that could have attacked his credibility, so they went around the edges you know, of attacking him. Also some substance there as well. Professor Kirk Burkhalter, you are awesome. Thank you so much. I hear you have to go, but how can people find you on Twitter? Because I know you're a new Twitter guy. <laughs> Just look for my name. It's going to be Kirk Burkhalter, at, and, and you, you can't miss it. So that's B-U-R-K-H-A-L-T-E-R. -E All right. Well, always a pleasure. Thank you for being on, sir. My pleasure. Okay. And guys, we're going to go back in the court for some of that live testimony. Manuals, uh, some other materials that they put out. I've also studied other methods of interrogation as well, but that is uh, the, uh, the organization where I went through training. What is the goal of an interrogation? Uh, the uh, the goal of an interrogation, broadly speaking, is to uh, try to solve a crime. Uh, the person being interrogated, uh, usually uh, a suspect the crime is believed to have uh, information that's relevant to solving the crime. So through the, the, the process of, of interrogation, uh, the investigator uh, tries to get information uh, from the suspect to help solve the crime. Doctor, are you familiar with the phrase guilt presumptive interrogation? Yes. And <clears throat> What, is that, what does that term mean and how are you familiar with it? Sure. Uh, guilt presumptive interrogation <coughs> means that for the purpose of interrogation, the investigator assumes the suspect uh, to be guilty. Uh, now, this is, this is part of the training uh, that's uh, uh, part of what we call the REAP technique, or as I mentioned earlier, the, the technique that REAP and Associates trains. The way it works is investigators develop a suspect uh, through other means. Uh, it could be through interviewing the suspect and the investigator thinks the suspect is being uh, deceptive other or otherwise holding, withholding the truth, or perhaps develops uh, a suspect through other evidence and then decides to interrogate the suspect. So at that stage, uh, when the investigator decides to interrogate the suspect, the, the investigator assumes for the purpose of the interrogation that the suspect is guilty. Well, why, why do that? The idea, uh, the goal is to get information from the suspect that helps solve the crime. The process involves using various tactics or techniques to try to get the suspect to confess to the crime, because once the suspect confesses to the crime, then it's easier to get the suspect to provide information such as how the crime was committed or other details uh, that the investigator then can then go out and try to corroborate with other evidence uh, and ultimately solve the crime. So guilt presumptive interrogation means for the exercise of interrogation, the investigator uh, assumes the suspect to be guilty. In your experience, doctor, is guilt presumptive interrogation in common practice? Yes. <coughs> Are you familiar with the term false confession? Yes. And can you define what false confession means to the jury? Sure. A false confession uh, is one in which an innocent suspect uh, falsely confesses to the crime of which he or she is accused. Are false confessions an actual thing? Uh, it is a thing. It, it, it may seem counterintuitive, uh, but uh, there are various ways that, that uh, innocent people uh, falsely confess. The most common way is that uh, in the course of, of coercive or highly persuasive interrogation, the suspect ends up basically um, succumbing to the pressure and, and confessing uh, to the crime. We know that false confessions uh, uh, occur uh, uh, for various reasons. 
There is, is a, a, a body of research on uh, known cases of wrongful conviction. Uh, there are organizations that, that keep data on wrongful convictions, and in those uh, cases, uh, false confessions come up uh, regularly. Uh, for example, the National Registry of, Ex of, of Exonerations, which is housed at the University of Michigan, has uh, to date counted uh, over 2,500 cases of known wrongful conviction, and uh, about 15% of those involve false admissions uh, or false confessions. Uh, the Innocence Project out of uh, New York City um, uh, logs um, exonerations uh, that are DNA-based. So the, the DNA evidence proved that the person is convicted and did not commit the crimes. And in those cases, uh, about 25 to 30% uh, uh, of the cases involve people falsely confessing uh, to the crime. So we know from actual cases that there, that there are instances of false confessions. But we also know because there's uh, a growing body of, of laboratory research in psychology departments on, on the, uh, false confessions where we're able to, um, uh, to get people to falsely confess to transgressions in, in our laboratories. So from various sources, we know that false confessions sometimes. Okay, so this is the defendant's false confession expert, if you will, qualified. Very, very good qualifications, Latonia. Um, I like the idea they went into the read technique. This is something that is very, very, very controversial. Uh, he explains as a process uh, to use a technique to get the defendant to confess. It's a guilt-based presumption that they believe the person is uh, guilty, and they want them to confess so they can get all the other easier details. But, of course, we always talk about the ball may be pointed towards a certain person. I've had this as an investigative person myself. It turns out the person that you believe did it didn't do it. That They then uh, tie that into the false confession piece, and he said, well, it's counterintuitive. Innocent people do do it. Through aggressive interrogation techniques, the defendant succumbs to pressure and gave some very interesting statistics. One that I found interesting is an innocence project in New York City that clears people via scientific evidence DNA. In those cases, 25 to 30 uh, percent of the cases involved false confessions. Now, I know it's a real thing from practicing for 30 years in both the prosecutor and defense side. That's a pretty extraordinary statistic I never heard. Right, exactly. And one of the things that's probably happening right now is you've got jurors who are really listening to what he's saying because you wouldn't think to yourself, why would somebody confess to something if you didn't do it, right? And so what he's explained to them is about how this process works. And so that all it really takes is for one juror, one juror to believe that maybe her confession was truly a coerced thing, it wasn't truly a true confession, that she felt kind of bullied into doing it, and if they have that doubt, that's all the defense needs. One person for doubt for purposes of her not to have be convicted. The prosecution has to make sure everybody believes their, their version of the case for their conviction. Look, I, I can tell you as a prosecutor myself, I've had cases where there had been a confession and the evidence was corroborated. Um, and it's, it just seemed unbelievable. I'm thinking of one in particular. And from some great defense work and investigative work they did on their end, uh, while you have it, the inertia is that you believe in your case as a prosecutor, literally turned my head around. And it turned out at the end of the day, when we started to reinvestigate the case, this person who had been in jail for a year, two years waiting for trial and something we were convinced he did it, the evidence looked overwhelming, in fact, didn't do it. Um, have you ever been involved in a scenario like that? And and as a prosecutor, obviously, that's really disheartening. No prosecutor wants to see something like that happen. I mean, I can't say that I've personally had that happen. I mean, I've seen other cases where that has been one of those results. But one of the things is, as a prosecutor, you have the ultimate duty still to ask for justice. And if at some point in time you start to see that the case, um, the evidence is not the way that you maybe originally thought it was, um, then you have an obligation having that bar license, being a prosecutor, you have that obligation then to do what you need to do with that case. If it means that it means to be dismissed, then you've got to dismiss it because you don't have the evidence to go forward. You still have to do the canons of ethics, 
even as a prosecutor. Yeah, and just so our, our audience knows, those rules, though, can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and prosecutorial culture within an agency is so important. I remember my first boss would always say, hey, listen, let's err on the side of caution that we don't convict an innocent person. There'll be plenty more cases coming down the pike we can prosecute. I like that philosophy. We'll be right back. I'm Aaron Keller, this week on the Law & Crime Network. The trial of real estate heir Robert Durst. He's accused of killing friend Susan Berman. Despite having never been contacted by investigators, Susan lied to Bob Durst and told him that she had been contacted. Because Durst previously killed his wife. Plus, the trial of a Michigan man accused of killing three people because of their sexual orientation. Join us on the Law & Crime Network for live coverage of America's most watched criminal cases. I'm Dan Abrams, and this is the Law & Crime Network. His body just went boom. She did it! The only 24-7 network with expert legal analysis and gavel to gavel live trial coverage. He kissed me goodbye on the cheek. That was the last time we saw him. From high profile cases to the most compelling local trials. You didn't expect her. Let me finish. We cover the most interesting and important legal news going on across the country. A verdict in the case of an Ohio woman who took the stand and admitted she shot and killed her military husband. <laughs> And our multi-platform brand is resonating from syndication. With more, we're joined by Law & Crime Network host Jesse Weber. To our expert analysis. With me now is Rachel Stockman, editor-in-chief for Law & Crime Network. This former head prosecutor, criminal defense attorney, and host of Law & Crime Network, Bob Bianchi. On Monday, the Law & Crime Network covering the trial live. With dozens of places to watch, we already have tens of millions of minutes viewed per month. And our viewers and readers are engaged. With more than 30,000 comments per month on the site, a bustling chat room, and an average watch time of 30 minutes. Womanizer, that's fine. It doesn't make me guilty of solicitation of capital murder. We got a lot of fascinating cases, as we always do, gavel to gavel coverage. In the fastest growing genre in America, we are uniquely positioned to dominate. This is Law and Crime. Our son Arjun was six weeks old and already had his first intestinal surgery when he was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. CF is a rare genetic life-shortening disease that affects every organ in the body and makes breathing difficult. At age three and a half, Arjun looks completely normal, but on his belly are scars from being in the operating room nine times, which can be a reminder of our family's daily fight to extend his life. Please help us win this fight. Join families like ours for Great Strides, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation's national walk in support of Arjun and all those living with CF. Every year, thousands of people lace up to raise money and awareness for CF. The CF Foundation has made amazing progress, but until CF stands for Cure Found, for all people with CF, including those like my son Arjun, we will not stop. The biggest reason I stride? Because I want Arjun to live a full and happy life. Visit CFF.org and sign up for a Great Strides Walk today. Lace up, walk, cure cystic fibrosis. Oh, hey, bud. Where, uh, where are you headed? Uh, I'm just gonna hang out. With Gary and Todd? Yeah. I've been meaning to ask you, is there any drinking going on in this crowd? No. If any of your buddies ever pressure you to take a drink, just tell them you promised your dad you wouldn't. I'd do anything to keep you safe. Okay, I will. I hope this is working. I promise. Love you too, Dad. They really do hear you. For tips on what to say, visit underagedrinking.samsa.gov. All right, welcome back to Defense False Confession Experts on the Stand, direct examination by the defense lawyer. Let's go to court. But regardless, the report uh, only refers to that one interview. Now, as far as the techniques and tactics that you observed that we're about to talk about, did you observe those same tactics utilized against Kelsey Thomas in the other portions that you were able to review that are not subject to this report? Yes. Okay. And so, Dr. Cutler, I was drawing your attention to table one that indicated the duration was three hours and three minutes. Um, what is, does that tell you anything at all? Uh, 
Or does, did that play a part in your analysis at all? Well, interrogation time is, uh, is one, uh, one factor uh, that we look at. It's, it's uh, uh, interrogation time uh, is a, a risk factor for false confession. Generally, that's what we're looking for in, in, in these uh, tactics is uh, whether uh, the extent to which they are creating risks, risk factors, or elevating the risk for false confession. We know from the research on interrogations and false confessions that, uh, <coughs> that, in, that length of interrogation uh, is a risk factor. Known cases of false confession uh, typically involve uh, uh, longer interrogation times than other cases. Moving on in your report, table two is labeled suspect information and personal risk factors. And your report indicates there are no risk factors uh, indicated there, correct? That's correct. Is that common that you would find <coughs> that the individual suspect would not present any personal risk factors and yet find that the interrogation as a whole is <coughs> a objection rating? <coughs> Sustained. Dr. Keller, uh, is it unusual that your findings in this case would be as they are, given the fact that there are no personal risk factors associated with Kelsey Thomas? Objection, maybe. Um, objection overruled. You can answer. Uh, it is fairly common uh, that we have um, um, in interrogations like this uh, with suspects who do not um, uh, possess uh, known risk factors for false confession. The next table listed in your report is entitled Physical Environment and Context, correct? Yes. And you have some factors listed there, one of which is uh, her being questioned, the agency of salary. Council testifying from the report. Um, sustain. Go ahead and rephrase. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Cutler, do you have your report there? Yes. You see in table three, uh, labeled physical environment and context? Yes. Were there any risk factors associated with table three that you found important or uh, relevant to your determination? Uh, yes, there were. Uh, and can you tell the jury about those factors? Uh, yes, uh, uh, two of the items pertain to uh, the length of the interrogation and, and the number of times uh, that uh, Ms. Thomas was uh, interrogated uh, within a relatively short uh, span of time. The issue with interrogation uh, length or amount of time uh, is that over time our resistance gets worn down. We, uh, our, our ability to uh, to regulate our, our thoughts, behaviors, and emotions uh, it comes to pleading over time. So when suspects go through longer periods of interrogation, their, re their resistance, their, uh, essentially their ability to defend themselves, continue to maintain their innocence, uh, becomes diminished. Also over time, where uh, suspects continue to maintain their innocence and argue their innocence over and over, that, um, that activity itself also diminishes over time uh, our, our ability uh, to resist. So time and number of interrogations over a short period of time, which is related to time, can lead to fatigue and, and reduced uh, resistance um, to the social influence that goes on in the interrogation. Uh, the third uh, pertains to uh, the, the actual environment in which interrogations are conducted. Interrogation, the interrogation in this case, as usually happens, is that uh, it's conducted in a, a small, relatively uh, barren room um, uh, where the, uh, the suspect does not have immediate access uh, to an advocate, social support, does not have the ability to communicate uh, 
uh, to anybody on, on the outside. The suspect is, is essentially isolated from, uh, from other uh, sources of, of support. Isolation is stressful for anybody. Uh, so over time, uh, uh, isolation adds stress and, and renders suspect uh, more susceptible to social influence. And just so the jury's clear, Dr. Cutler, did you find those factors present in this case? Yes. Specifically, what were those? <clears throat> uh, well, the, the uh, interrogation uh, lasted, um, the interrogation that we coded lasted about three hours, uh, but Ms. Thomas was co uh, continuous, continuously questioned for a much longer period of time, I believe it was about eight hours, um, through, through multiple um, uh, interrogations, uh, interviews and interrogations, and the interrogation that we coded was, was conducted in a, a relatively small uh, barren room the likes of which can contribute to a sense of, of isolation and add to stress. As part of your analysis, you um, sort of compiled a summary of the known tactics that were used in this case? Is that correct? Right? And when you use the word tactic, what do you mean? Uh, tactics are, uh, are essentially strategies or tools that interrogation... All right, so the defense is a forensic expert on false confessions, very highly qualified guy in all manners, from writing to testifying, uh, hands-on application to teaching. Latonia, um, let, uh, first part of this I want to go over. He indicated in questioning that he was not here to say if the defendant was telling the truth or not in the case. Um, but he was saying that it was highly aggressive and could lead to a false confession. Um, so he wasn't testifying to the ultimate facts of the matter. Is that a legal thing, you think, or just not a place he wanted to go? Well, I mean, I think a good expert tells you what they can and can't be able to make a, an opinion about. I think what he seems to be more of an expert about is about the tactics that are being used, whether or not they could elicit a false confession or not whether or not, as opposed to whether or not she truly gave a false confession. Um, and that's probably the best thing as an expert to be able to do. It makes you more credible that you're not just being paid money and you're going to give the whoever's paying you um, the money, the, the testimony that they want. So that makes them a little bit more credible. Yeah, I, I kind of felt the same way. Uh, but something tells me that um, ultimately, he knew that maybe that could get struck down and giving an ultimate conclusion about whether she was lying or not. But still, the jury's hearing it as, I'm not going to offer you that opinion. So we go into the next area of the questioning, which is the risk factors involved in the false confession scenario. He lists off the number of times she was interrogated in a short period of time um, over the ability of, the, they, they have the ability for resistance and to regulate thoughts breaks down, the environment of being a small barren room with the suspect with no a access to an advocate or social support, uh, they're isolated and isolation is stressful. Um, and he basically is tying that into all the factors that were occurring um, during Kelsey's interrogation by the police. I, I thought it was uh, pretty effective from the standpoint of coming from the credible mouth of a victim and circling it back to the facts of this particular case. Oh, I, I would agree with you there. I mean, he's a good expert witness. He's a good witness. He knows what he's doing, and he's able to communicate that in a way that the jurors can get to. The problem that the defense has, which is what the prosecution has at their benefit, is not just this idea of the confession. It's what's going on with regard to the medical examiner's conclusions as well. So if you add those things together, it becomes kind of like one of those things that like, what's the totality of what happened here? Um, it's not just the fact that maybe this confession is false. If, if you believe it to be true that what she said actually occurred, that she truly did this, it coincides also with what the medical examiner has testified to. And so the the defense has to be able to fight both of these things, um, the confession and the medical evidence at the same time. So you can't take them independently. They've got to be able to hit both. But once again, the defense only has to convince one person of doubt for yeah, purposes the, 
their client. And the interesting part of this case is the medical examiner was precluded from testifying as to manner of death, which is, uh, to me, a big blow as a homicide prosecutor myself, uh, in addition to the fact that the defense got an expert uh, forensic pathologist that contradicted uh, the opinions that actually came out, uh, saying there's a difference between strangulation versus um, an actual homicide itself, although, again, they weren't allowed to testify to manner of death. Excellent analysis. Latonia, appreciate it. We're going to take a quick break here at the Little Crime Network, and we'll be right back. I'll be here to three. I'm Dan Abrams, and this is the Law and Crime Network. His body just went boom. She did it. The only 24-7 network with expert legal analysis and gavel-to-gavel -gavel live trial coverage. He kissed me goodbye on the cheek. That was the last time we saw him. From high-profile cases to the most compelling local trials. You didn't expect her. Let me finish. We cover the most interesting and important legal news going on across the country. A verdict in the case of an Ohio woman who took the stand and admitted she shot and killed her military husband. And our multi-platform brand is resonating. From syndication. With more, we're joined by Law and Crime Network host Jesse Weber. To our expert analysis. With me now is Rachel Stockman, editor-in-chief for Law and Crime Network. This former head prosecutor, criminal defense attorney, and host of Law and Crime Network, Bob Bianchi. On Monday, the Law and Crime Network covering the trial live. With dozens of places to watch, we already have tens of millions of minutes viewed per month. And our viewers and readers are engaged. With more than 30,000 comments per month on the site, a bustling chat room, and an average watch time of 30 minutes. Womanizer, that's fine. It doesn't make me guilty of solicitation of capital murder. We got a lot of fascinating cases, as we always do, gavel to gavel coverage. In the fastest growing genre in America, we are uniquely positioned to dominate. This is Lawn Crime. We serve the entire state of Missouri. On the west side of Chicago. We serve families that live in Washington, D.C. Prevention is at the core, whether that's mental health, physical health, school readiness. Drugs, alcohol, mental health, suicide, underage drinking, and tobacco use. Marijuana, all the way up to opioids, cocaine. If it's a drug, we are there to try and prevent it. National Prevention Week is a celebration of all the things that happen all year long. Some of our National Prevention Week activities have been focusing on the illegal drugs, illegal use of opioids. Prevention is about saving lives. This is where it happens. This is where it happens. This is where it happens. This is Prevention at Work. Our son Arjun was six weeks old and already had his first intestinal surgery when he was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. CF is a rare genetic life-shortening disease that affects every organ in the body and makes breathing difficult. At age three and a half, Arjun looks completely normal, but on his belly are scars from being in the operating room nine times, which can be a reminder of our family's daily fight to extend his life. Thanks to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, we know we are not in this fight alone. When the foundation was founded in 1955, children with CF rarely live long enough to attend kindergarten. Today, thanks to the foundation's groundbreaking research, advocacy, and care, some people with CF are attending college, getting married, and starting families. But there is still much work to be done until CF stands for Cure Found. For all people with CF, including those like my son Arjun, we will not stop. Help us add tomorrow's. Visit cff.org today. We all want our kids to grow up safe and healthy, so we show them how, and we tell them, with honest conversations that let them know what we expect. That's especially important when it comes to alcohol and other drugs. Kids need to know the dangers and how to avoid them. And when it comes to pain medications, opioids, they need to know that they should never be taken without a prescription and never shared with friends or family. It's dangerous and illegal. So talk with your kids, because when you talk, they hear you. Okay, in the Kelsey Thomas case, the f forensic expert testifying for the defense on false confessions is still on the stand. Let's go to court.
based on your experience and research, is emotional provocation a tactic employed? Uh, yes. And uh, what can you tell the jury about emotional provocation? Uh, emotional provocation is um, the uh, uh, it's basically designed to uh, to add stress uh, to the uh, interrogation uh, to uh, make the suspect uh, uh, feel guilty uh, about the act. It adds stress. Was that employed in this case? It was. <coughs> and what did what did your team document in that regard? We found 12 instances uh, of emotional provocation in, uh, in the interrogation that we reviewed. Moving on, Doctor, what are confrontational tactics and why are they risk factors for a false confession? Uh, confrontational tactics are an important part of, of guilt uh, presumptive interrogation. The idea is uh, to confront the suspect early on uh, with, uh, with being guilty uh, by uh, uh, expressing, by directly accusing the suspect of having committed the crime, by expressing certainty uh, in the suspect's uh, guilt, uh, by uh, uh, leveraging authority. Um, so for example, we're, we're a very experienced police officer. We've been doing this uh, a long time. Uh, it involves uh, uh, derogating information provided by the suspect, such as accusing the suspect of, of lying, of being deceptive, and uh, uh, these sorts of confrontational uh, tactics uh, are uh, they're important, essential parts of putting pressure on the suspect to confess. How many times did you and your team document confrontational tactics being used against Kelvin Thomas? in the three-hour interview you review. Uh, 153 times. Moving on, Dr. Cutler, what are minimizing tactics and why are they risk factors for a false confession? Whereas confrontation tactics put pressure on suspects to confess, minimizing tactics uh, essentially make it easier for a suspect uh, to confess. So uh, they include things like appealing to the suspect's uh, self-interest, um, trying to convince the suspect that he or she is, um, it, it's in his or her own best interest to confess, um, downplaying the seriousness, uh, of the crime, making it seem like it's, it's not as, as, as heinous or problematic as it is, uh, blaming other people uh, uh, for, for the crime, taking the blame off the suspect, and also uh, providing them justifications uh, for the crime, uh, such as you, 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 you're not a, a, a bad person, you didn't do this deliberately, this was an accident, um, or, um, um, or a, a spur of the moment thing rather than a, a, a planned uh, decision. Those are, are uh, justifications. Uh, our research on minimization tactics uh, show that they also increase the risk uh, of false confession. Uh, and the mechanism by which they do that, and actually interrogators are, are trained uh, about this, is that um, Minimization tactics by offering essentially excuses uh, for having committed the crime, it, it gets suspects to believe that they will be treated more leniently uh, for confessing um, than for maintaining uh, their, their innocence. So it's not explicitly saying that, I mean, they're not explicitly told that they will be treated more leniently, but these minimization tactics lead suspects to conclude that on their own. Dr. Cutler, if in this case, ultimately 
Ultimately, Kelsey Thomas was presented by investigators with two options. One is she's a monster who would just kill her daughter premeditatedly, or she is the overburdened mom who just snapped. Is that a minimization tactic that was employed there? Uh, it's in part a minimization tactic. It's also another tactic uh, uh, that we, uh, we call um, uh, alternative questions. Uh, the idea is to uh, limit the suspect's degree of choices. So you notice being innocent wasn't one of those choices in that example. It was uh, agreed to have committed the crime for this reason, which sounds awful, you're a monster, or agreed to this more um, excusable version of the crime that it was uh, an accident. Um, that agreeing to, uh, to the more minimized version of the crime leads people to think that they'll be treated more leniently uh, uh, for confessing. So it's that alternative question where, where the uh, suspect is provided with two options, uh, one uh, uh, sounding more excusable uh, than the other. And, and the, tech, the idea of providing excuses as we're having committed the crime is part of minimization. How many times did you and your team document minimizing tactics being used against Kelsey Thomas in a three hour interview? Uh, we found 65 instances. Tony, I don't know about you, but I find this to be fascinating testimonies, experts laying out. I've heard it before, but he's doing it in a really, really good way with the jury, with the risk factors that can lead to false uh, confessions, and then documenting how many times it actually occurred during the interview of the defendant in the case. Uh, some of those were called confrontational tactics. Look, I've seen all this done. I mean, I'm sure you have too, uh, Latonia. Um, where they're, they're certain of his guilt and accusing him of lying and deception 153 times, minimization tactics, making it easier for the defendant to confess, um, blame other people, say it's not so heinous, providing a justification just to get them to say uh, that they did it, the evidence bluff, where they say they have evidence that they actually don't have, that occurred three times here. Um, there was also the alternative question where they only give them two options, one basically you're a monster or the other one you're just an overburdened mom that made a mistake, but they don't leave an option of that you could be innocent of all this. And on and on we could go. I can't wait to see the cross-examination here because for my, where I sit, I've listened to this before, he's telling you what the literature says about all this. Thoughts? I think you're absolutely correct, um, and he's a really good witness. And he, the defense need, need him to be a very good witness because it's very hard for a layperson out there to think to themselves, why would you confess to killing your child if you didn't do it? And so you need this strong testimony for the defense to be able to tackle that because for most people, you wouldn't understand why you would do that. Yeah, and I think that in the way that he did is unlike what I've ever seen other witnesses do, is those examples that he was giving along the way, I think could resonate with each individual juror who in their own lives, not having been confronted with crimes, but with difficult scenarios where they're being questioned about what it is that they did or they didn't do. I think he, he put it in layman's terms enough where somebody could say, yeah, I can kind of get what he's saying there. Right, exactly. And it goes back to what I stated before, which is, all the defense needs is one person to believe their thought process about this um, and to have that doubt. And if his testimony is strong enough for them to overcome that idea that this isn't true, that she she truly was, uh, you know, did a false confession because of what coercive tactics by the police, then if you get one person to believe that, then the defense has a win for purposes of making sure their client isn't convicted. Okay, yeah, for sure. I always say you try the case to one, hopefully 12, but the defense only needs one to get a mistrial in the case of the hung jury. This is the Law and Crime Network. we got a lot on the plate still going today, so stick with us. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back.
I'm Dan Abrams, and this is the Law and Crime Network. His body just went boom. She did it. The only 24-7 network with expert legal analysis and gavel to gavel live trial coverage. He kissed me goodbye on the cheek. That was the last time we saw him. From high profile cases to the most compelling local trials. You didn't expect her. Let me finish. We cover the most interesting and important legal news going on across the country. A verdict in the case of an Ohio woman who took the stand and admitted she shot and killed her military husband. And our multi platform brand is resonating from syndication. With more, we're joined by Law and Crime Network host Jesse Weber. To our expert analysis. With me now is Rachel Stockman, editor in chief for Law and Crime Network. This former head prosecutor, criminal defense attorney, and host of Law and Crime Network, Bob Bianchi. On Monday, the Law and Crime Network covering the trial live. With dozens of places to watch, we already have tens of millions of minutes viewed per month. And our viewers and readers are engaged. With more than 30,000 comments per month on the site, a bustling chat room, and an average watch time of 30 minutes. Womanizer, that's fine. It doesn't make me guilty of solicitation of capital murder. We got a lot of fascinating cases, as we always do, gavel to gavel coverage. In the fastest growing genre in America, we are uniquely positioned to dominate. This is Law and Crime. Our son Arjun was six weeks old and already had his first intestinal surgery when he was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. CF is a rare genetic life-shortening disease that affects every organ in the body and makes breathing difficult. At age three and a half, Arjun looks completely normal, but on his belly are scars from being in the operating room nine times, which can be a reminder of our family's daily fight to extend his life. Thanks to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, we know we are not in this fight alone. When the foundation was founded in 1955, children with CF rarely lived long enough to attend kindergarten. Today, thanks to the foundation's groundbreaking research, advocacy, and care, some people with CF are attending college, getting married, and starting families. But there is still much work to be done until CF stands for Cure Found for all people with CF, including those like my son Arjun, we will not stop. Help us add tomorrows. Visit CFF.org today. In every family, small conversations can make a big impact. I grew up on tour with my parents. Kind of different, but we bonded over music and we talked. Honest conversations, like when my dad shared his experiences as an alcoholic. Your honesty gave me a sense of integrity that I wanted in my own life. And I wanted you to know from someone who's been in recovery more than 30 years now, that hard work is what creates success, not alcohol or other drugs in whatever you do. Talk, they hear you. All right, in the Kelsey Thomas case, did she kill uh, you know, her five-year-old? We are looking at a defense expert on false confessions. Let's go live to court. That, um, uh, the, the ideas were largely provided by the investigators uh, in the case, uh, rather than by uh, Ms. Thomas. Can you provide the jury with some explicit examples of that happening in Kelsey Thomas's interrogation? Yes. Um, so, um, uh, these are some of the, the points that we um, uh, documented were first mentioned uh, by the investigators. Um, uh, at one point when the investigator said, what happens when you come back in and look at her? She's still in the same spot, wasn't she? Is that when you knew that maybe you had pushed too hard? Uh, it was also the investigators who first suggested that Chloe died while lying in bed. And Ms. Thomas was pushing down on her. Uh, after uh, uh, Ms. Thomas uh, agreed, um, the investigators uh, essentially rebuked her and pointed out that the ligature markings were not consistent with that version of events. They repeatedly told Ms. Thomas that her confession must match the medical evidence and told her exactly uh, what the medical evidence showed. Um, one of the investigators suggested that Chloe's shirt was pushed upwards and might have caused the marks around Chloe's neck. Um, as Thomas responded that she might have, uh, she was so angry uh, when, um, when I 
was pushing for a shirt that might have gone up. Uh, the investigator suggested that the ligature markings were made by something being placed around Crowley's neck and force being applied in an upward direction. Uh, let's see. Uh, there, there was another uh, uh, point um, uh, where the investigators were asking Ms. Thomas uh, about her uh, thought processes and whether she uh, experienced um, uh, remorse. Uh, it, it's another form of, of contamination, but we find that in, uh, in known cases of false confession, it's not uncommon to have expressions of remorse and apologies. Uh, there was a study published in one of our uh, uh, forensic psychology journals um, uh, where the investigators analyzed, I think it was about 20 uh, known cases of false confessions and found that about a quarter of them uh, involved uh, apologies uh, by uh, the suspect. So uh, in, encouraging uh, the suspect to, you know, to apologize or asking about remorse is, is another form of, of contamination. And on that topic, doctor, uh, would that also include apology letters? It's, that's a, a form of, uh, uh, of, of an apology, yes. Were you aware that Kelsey Thomas wrote an apology letter in this case? Yes. And that would be consistent with, uh, again, your statement that um, that was you. Staying. Would that be consistent with uh, contamination uh, of the confession? Uh, yes, it could be. That was in fact suggested by uh, one of the investigators for her to do that, correct? Yes. All right, getting a little quiet there, so Latoni gives us some opportunities to go through some of this testimony. I found it to be uh, very fascinating. So uh, he listed this expert the number of instances in which the risk factors uh, that he was referring to existed in many, many different ways with this particular investigation. And then he started getting into uh, a lot of other areas where this confession could have been cross-contaminated by information. Now, I saw one of our uh, great uh, chatters in the law and crime uh, blogosphere that watches our trials, a true crew aficionado, said, what's wrong with asking for remorse? And he gave an interesting statistic that said a very high percentage of those people, a quarter, who falsely confessed actually say they have remorse and an apology. My experience with that has been is that when the officers are saying that to you, you, you figure, well, I, I, I should have remorse. You're actually trying to find a way to confirm the false confession confession. Um, so they would, he says that's not unusual. It happens in a quarter of the cases. What did you think about that? I mean, it's interesting, all these uh, different uh, stats. Um, some of it's alarming. Uh, so here's the reality. We've got to see what the prosecution comes back with, with regard to cross-examining him. Right now, everything's going to sound and should sound really in favor of the defense, because this is the defense witness. Um, and talking about these stats. That's the reason why they have him testify, so that they can be able to try to say that their client did not uh, really mean this confession. It was something that was, in a sense, coerced out of her, and that this is something that happens when you get these type of interrogation tactics. So it'll be interesting to see what happens, how he holds up, under cross-examination. Yeah, and you know, one of the greatest uh, detectives that I know that gave interviews would always do that one technique he talked about, 
I don't think it led to false confessions because we were able to corroborate the information where he was actually very nice and basically saying, look, he used to use the word. I don't want you to look like a monster. Uh, I want to be able to tell my people your story so that people can put it in context and understand it. And he was prolific at getting confessions from people. But again, I emphasize all those confessions were solidly uh, corroborated by other independent evidence that the defendant would not, not have known unless the person committed the crime. Correct. And that's what we've got to look at for this case as well, is it can't be that the confession on its own is enough for the prosecution's case. They've got beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. They've got to be able to show how other information, whether or not it's a medical exam or other things, come into play to make it seem more likely than not that that confession that she gave was truly the truth. Okay, let's so tell you, I'm going to have to cut you short there. I really apologize, but we're coming to a hard break right now. My name is Bob Bianchi. You can find me at RBianchiESQ, but don't go anywhere. The great Michael Bryant is coming up next. Stay with us. I'm Dan Abrams, and this is the Law and Crime Network. His body just went boom. She did it. The only 24-7 network with expert legal analysis and gavel-to-gavel -gavel live trial coverage. He kissed me goodbye on the cheek. That was the last time we saw him. From high-profile cases to the most compelling local trials. You didn't expect her. Let me finish. We cover the most interesting and important legal news going on across the country. A verdict in the case of an Ohio woman who took the stand and admitted she shot and killed her military husband. <laughs> and our multi-platform brand is resonating. From syndication... With more, we're joined by Law & Crime Network host Jesse Weber. ...to our expert analysis. With me now is Rachel Stockman, editor-in-chief for Law & Crime Network. This former head prosecutor, criminal defense attorney, and host of Law & Crime Network, Bob Bianchi. On Monday, the Law & Crime Network covering the trial live. With dozens of places to watch, we already have tens of millions of minutes viewed per month. And our viewers and readers are engaged. With more than 30,000 comments per month on the site, a bustling chat room, and an average watch time of 30 minutes. Womanizer, that's fine. It doesn't make me guilty of solicitation of capital murder. We got a lot of fascinating cases, as we always do, gavel to gavel coverage. In the fastest growing genre in America, we are uniquely positioned to dominate. This is Lawn Crime. Our son Arjun was six weeks old and already had his first intestinal surgery when he was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. CF is a rare genetic life-shortening disease that affects every organ in the body and makes breathing difficult. At age three and a half, Arjun looks completely normal, but on his belly are scars from being in the operating room nine times, which can be a reminder of our family's daily fight to extend his life. Thanks to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, we know we are not in this fight alone. When the foundation was founded in 1955, children with CF rarely lived long enough to attend kindergarten. Today, thanks to the foundation's groundbreaking research, advocacy, and care, some people with CF are attending college, getting married, and starting families. But there is still much work to be done until CF stands for Cure Found. For all people with CF, including those like my son Arjun, we will not stop. Help us add tomorrow's. Visit cff.org today. You talk to In every family, small conversations can make a big impact. I grew up on tour with my parents. Kind of different, but we bonded over music just like other families do over sports, camping, or other interests. And we talked. Little everyday conversations from silly to serious that built a foundation over time. Honest conversations like when my dad shared his experiences as an alcoholic. Your honesty about that part of your life gave me a sense of integrity that I wanted to uphold in my own life. And I was so grateful that you and mom had become these sober, stable people who were always there for me. I wanted you to know from someone who's been in recovery more than 30 years now, that hard work is what creates success, not alcohol or other drugs, whether it's music or anything else. I said it a lot, and I'm glad you took it to heart. Talk, they hear you. For more information about talking with your kids about underage use of alcohol and other drugs, visit underagedrinking.samhsa.gov. Are you thinking about buying medicine online? A search for online pharmacies yields more than 20 million results. But which ones can you trust? 
Medicines bought from unlicensed online pharmacies can be dangerous. You may get a fake drug, your condition may get worse, or you may experience a bad reaction. Don't put your health at risk. To learn how to find an online pharmacy that's safe and legal, visit fda.gov slash besaferx. A message from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration.